cameras on so that we can see that we love seeing you. So welcome everybody. We'll start with Karakia this evening. And thank you to Fire Mill for her blessing for me to do this. We've got a wonderful panel as we'll see and we'll introduce uh, very soon. Nice, nice. To tawa mai i raro, to tawa mai i waho, to tawa mai i roto. Kia ta ai, te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, homie, hoie, tai kia. So thank you everybody for taking the time to join us this evening um, on um, our topic of tackling and reducing burnout. And um, before I introduce, as I say, our lovely panel of um, Dr. Tom and Nikki Hart, or they will introduce themselves, I'll start with my pipi This meeting is being recorded. I'm still getting a little bit of background noise, but hopefully the quality of um, the sound is okay for everybody. Um, but as I say, I'll start with my pipi hat. O tararua te monga, ko waikanai te awa, i te tu ake aho i Gateshead, England. Ko Wayne Maxwell takutane no wardapa ai. Ko Flynn Rua, ko Tara aku tamariki. Ko Amajit Maxwell aho, tena koutou, tena koutou, tena tato katoa. Um, could I ask you, Dr. Tom, to introduce yourself? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along. A few familiar faces I see logging in, um, colleagues around the country. So, yeah, I've got more of an update on, on my uh, whakapapa in my presentation, but nice to see you, and hopefully we provide some value. Oh, thank you, Tom. And Nikki? Sorry, the terrible unmuting business. Um, お、<笑> Uh, uh, warm greetings. I'm Nikki, and my role is CEO at Fielding Healthcare. Oh, Namihi, Nikki. Um, we, before we jump into things, um, Kirsten, do you want to jump ahead to slide four? Just thought we'd have a bit of light relief before we get into the, the topic. Um, and also just in terms of um, our audience tonight, what I'm keen to do is just get a little bit of um, interaction as best we can in terms of Zoom um, and ask you to use the chat function um, and basically just add into the chat where you're from. And, and if you're comfortable, share one example of what you have done recently to improve your own well-being. I think just giving some thought to that and sharing those ideas um will will help us all in reality you know uh, get us thinking about what we can all do kirsten is going to run a couple of polls um to see you know again get a sense of um who's online um what area of um profession or interest uh, you're working in and then just again generally how you're feeling um so those will come through fairly soon and um Without further ado, I will hand over to our first panelist, um, Dr. Tom, but just be aware that um, we will have some time for Q&A later as well. 
insisting they are safe and they will get the care that they need. All right, so that's me. I'm good to go. Yeah, and just a reminder to keep your mics on mute if that's um, just getting a bit of background noise. But yes, over to you, Dr. Tom. Okay, you can see that okay. So just a bit of an outline of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Burnout, a bit of an intro about myself, some definitions of burnout, and basically how to measure, manage, and monitor it. Um, and a few other tools I'm going to throw in uh, around what I've learned over my 31-year uh, career. Whoops, I went a bit fast. So... Sorry. So yeah, look, I'm an ED doctor. I've been working 31 years. I graduated, do a lot of rural GP. Good to see Steve Hoskin there and Tiana. I'm doing locums there and been a doctor for St. John. And uh, I got this old retro Chevy V8 ambulance to quit burnout myself and been around the country about nine times in that ambulance and also circumnavigated New Zealand in my own boat um, doing house calls. So yeah, I've got quite an eclectic um, medical career and I also work on... Um, boats as, as an expedition doctor uh, but in terms of in my 31 years you know it's um i've had two burnouts the first one was about 14 weeks off in the year 2000 which we're going to talk about shortly and then another one probably about seven years ago when i was working in another ed and they were doing 33 hour um shifts and uh yeah sort of one and two and it didn't take long before you're in just this permanent uh jet lag but uh, over 20 years ago now, I started a company called Dr. Global, which was kind of, I could be called the great grandfather of telehealth um, and was running my own general practice and um, was running telehealth uh, last century. And we made it onto 60 Minutes. As children call him daddy.com, he calls himself Dr. Tom, but he's probably better known as Dr. Global. By any standards, Tom Myholland is an extraordinary person. At 38, he's a mad keen surfer flies a vampire jet. He's a qualified forest ranger, biologist, and general practitioner, and doctor for the Taranaki rugby team. But he also happens to be the founder of Dr. Global, an internet medical service he passionately believes will improve your health care by seeing your doctor less. Dr. Tom is stirring up the medical profession from a place he calls Taradice, the Taranaki town of Okato. You want to go faster? How fast you want to go? His kids call him Daddy.com. Tom Mulholland, an Okato GP with a first class honours degree in molecular biology. He's the face, the founder of Dr. Global, an idea he thought would finance this laid back lifestyle. We, so as a result of that screening on 60 Minutes, I uh, got four uh, serious phone calls. The first one was uh, the LTSA telling me to get a properly fitting helmet for my daughter, Olivia. Um, uh, so I'm a doctor, I should know better. Second one was a consultant from Jenny Craig offering me a weight reduction program because the back tire of the bike was pretty flat. Um, thirdly, it was uh, the College of GPs um, because the name, you don't have much control over what 60 Minutes put and uh, they put the, the name of the, was daddy.com, but the name of the company was drglobal.com. So uh, when anyone logged on to daddy.com, that was actually a porn site, not, a, not internet medicine. So that was a little bit stressful. Uh, but the fourth phone call I got was my wife saying, listen, I don't want to be your wife anymore. You know, you're working long hours, you're not yourself. And, um, and she wanted a divorce. So that kind of threw everything, you know, um, out of kilter and yeah, difficulty sleeping and all the, the symptoms of burnout and, and trying to run a family and run a practice and run an internet company. And you know, I don't, don't have really time to go into too much about that, but I made it out the other side. I had to take 14 weeks off and did all the right things and, and uh, discovered what I called healthy thinking. And then um, 60 Minutes came back because they um, heard about this doctor that I, I went from um, being suicidal in my garage doing stand-up comedy in six weeks. And I wouldn't recommend that as a therapeutic option um, but anyway um, we made it on to 60 minutes again then only five years old she became the turning point for Tom's recovery what did you say to him um, I saw dad crying out on the still out on our porch there by the wisteria and I sat on his knee on a still and I said don't worry dad it's not the end of the world because mum used to always say that to me and what did your dad do when you said that? Um, I guess he just kind of stopped crying a bit and then put his head up. Isn't she lovely? So that's my daughter, Olivia. Um, but anyway, so 
yeah, it was a bit of a journey, really. I had to go down to the medical council and I had income protection insurance, which was, you know, very lucky. Well, it took a while to pay. But um, anyway, uh, and I went into the medical council and, you know, it was pretty hard to get into med school and people weren't talking about this 20 years ago. Um, and uh, But anyway, the, the lady at the medical council patted me on the hand and said, don't worry, dear. Um, we find the doctors that um, put their hands up and say they're struggling and get help do really, really well. It's the ones that try and hide it that we have to chase. So there's a bit of a take-home point uh, if you're, if you're having experience like this, get some help and get it sorted early on. Um, otherwise, before you make a mistake or you know something happens that you, they may not be able to fix. But anyway, after going through this burnout, I thought, right, I've got to change my attitude. I've got to find a way out of it. And I'm going to talk a little about hardware and software. So, yeah, you know, my hardware was run down. So I had to exercise, nutrition, all the things we know and say. But um, I discovered a software application called Healthy Thinking. So I didn't really want to go back working in Taranaki because everyone had seen my story a bit on 60 Minutes. I mean, I lived there. So I thought, why don't I go somewhere else? Uh, so I'll do a locum to the Chatham Islands. This is me doing a, a GP locum in the Chathams. Um, on the way back from Pitt Island and uh, took the kids there and sort of got back into life really um, and then wrote this book Healthy Thinking which ended up in about 12 languages. So I, I was worried at the time that you know the profession would, would you know have, give me a hard time and but they actually made me an honorary lecturer in psychological medicine at the University of Auckland because I started speaking at conferences and I've done over 2,000 talks um, at conferences now about burnout and, and uh, just sharing my kind of story really. So look, let's go for a definition. We all need definitions, um, um, whether it's nursing school or med school or, you know, um, practice manager school. So um, burnout is a syndrome conceptualised resulting from chronic workplace stress. It's not been successfully managed. Obviously, it's characterised by major, three major dimensions, really. Feelings of energy, depletion or exhaustion. Um, increased mental distance from one's job, so you get depersonalised feelings of negativism or cynicism relating to one's job, and then reduced um, professional efficacy, and that's um, a bit of a mouthful, but that's the you know, WHO um, guidelines for burnout, and some of you might um, be recognising some of these uh, symptoms. Um, one in three healthcare workers have burnout currently, and one in two have had it. And I think what really, you know, if you look at Maslach and how the stuff sort of came out in the 70s, um, healthcare workers are a lot more uh, likely to get it. Um, and also uh, increased substance abuse, broken relationships and suicide. And, and certainly out of my class of med school, I think we've had six of our class members now have taken their own life. Um, uh, and also it leads to you know, professional errors and mistakes. So it's another reason to intervene early so we don't make clinical mistakes uh, when our prefrontal cortex shuts down. Um, so risk factors for burnout, you've got a heavy workload and work long hours as primary care uh, and secondary care, you know, working in emergency departments or surgical registrars, you know, um, just working huge hours. Um, you struggle a lot with your work-life balance. Um, you work in a health and helping profession, that's us, healthcare. You can get compassion fatigue. Uh, there's only so many, so much compassion you can have. And Tony Fernando is an expert on this stuff. Uh, you feel you have little or no control over your work, and certainly, you know, um, just the amount of patients that come in, especially if you're in walk in clinics or the emergency department, you're working really hard, and then suddenly you're just flooded with um, another five ambulances or another 30 walk ins, or um, you're just thinking you need to go home at the end of the day and there's a fracture you've got to fix or something, um, or someone needing some urgent meds. Um, perfectionism, uh, that's another a risk factor. Uh, we've got to get everything right. Um, it pays to in our job, but, you know, we can just go a little bit too far at times. Uh, and, you know, what I've found working in the wellness space and with corporates for so long, when I go and do work in, in the general practice, um, the, the complexity of patients is huge and you have little time for talking about wellness to patients, let alone um, yourself. So what I'm big on is, is a bit of a definition, and, and but how do we measure it, um, how do we manage it, and, and how do we monitor burnout to make sure that we're not, um, you know, um, it just sort of creeps up on us, right? So symptoms and signs, um, you can feel a sense of failure and self-doubt, um, especially with those difficult patients, you can feel helpless, trapped and defeated. It's not a very cheerful webinar, this is it, but we'll, um, we'll cheer it up. Uh, detachment, feeling alone in the world, um, loss of motivation. We can become increasingly cynical and negative outlook and, you know, that medical humour um, certainly can, you know, if other people listen to it, they wonder how we can think like that at times. Uh, we get decreased satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment, uh, irritability, tachycardia, arrhythmia, insomnia, depression, anxiety, and stress. So, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of um, symptoms and signs. 
how do we actually measure it? Well, there's a burnout test, the Maslach burnout inventory, and it's sort of broken into three areas, uh, exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal achievement. So I feel emotionally drained by my work. And you can go online, actually, I went online um, today to try and fill one out, it cost me $15, and I'm still waiting for the email, so which might have contributed to my burnout. But, uh, you know, it's, it's important to score the stuff, and I'm a big um, believer, unless we measure stuff, we can't manage it. Um, section B, you know, I, I, you know, this is around big and personal. Um, you, you, at the end of the day, you, you run out of patience. You don't care what happens to some of your colleagues or clients. You know, you just start to detach um, from your job. And the third part of these 22 questions in the Maslach um, burnout inventory, um, this is a physician um, or medical um, version as well. Um, and uh, here's some other questions around, this is sort of reversely scored, but, you know, do you, you feel like you've got a lot of energy and, um, you know, you you're, uh, easily understand what my colleagues or clients feel. And so, you know, I think it's if you are feeling some of these uh, symptoms, it's important to, to measure it, not, you know, if in general practice or wherever you're in primary care, maybe we should be doing this kind of monthly, just uh, seeing how we're tracking. Uh, this was the big one for me when, when I figured out that I was burning out. I was working at a night shift um, at Taranaki Base Hospital and um, there was an alcoholic patient there and I wanted to organise a CT and the nurse said, um, don't worry, they're always in. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't really care, you know. And that was a real warning bell for me and I had to go in the next day and say, look, I don't think I'm well. I'm not, I'm not, I would never ever think that I didn't become a doctor to think that. And that was the the, the single question and I, I just lost my empathy and I thought I need some time off and I need to get some tools to get sorted really which fortunately I did before uh, anything untoward happened so you know I'm really big on this um, unless you measure things you can't manage them and when I was driving around in my ambulance about five years ago I just noted people didn't know their numbers so I invented this kind app which stands for know your numbers dashboard and um, quite a few of you logged in to it I appreciate it um, and what I've started let's actually log in there if, if you haven't um, to our HNZ and you can log into the kind wellness app um, download it and have a look but what I've noticing now is, is, is patterns of burnout so orange red lights what we call healthy thinking orange and depression anxiety and stress uh, a red light for sleep um, you might have a red light for, for heart rate um, and, and I can start to see, you know, look at a mix of burnout coming through in our kind app. Um, I'm big on uh, this Tackett Super syndrome and certainly a Christchurch earthquakes, uh, but some of the physiological consequences of burnout, it's just not the cognitive ones. But um, if, you know, if you've got red lights for depression, anxiety, and stress, um, you uh, may end up in VT, right? No, none of us wants to end up in that Tackett Super syndrome, broken heart syndrome. And just a quick review of the parasympathetic and sympathetic. I just want to give you a bit of a physiological view of burnout. And obviously, our sympathetic is, is the you know fight, freeze, or flight, and more adrenaline. I've got another you know another shift to do, and I've got another helicopter coming in, or whatever. I'm going out in one. And the parasympathetic obviously is our break, um, and uh, you know the vagus nerve, and that, that slows our heart rate down. But if we if we're working long hours, and if we you know it's not just what we do at work, it's what we do at home. And if you might be running a farm or have three young kids or whatever or three old kids older kids um, we just burn out and, and we lose this heart rate variability now when I was um, at the University of Auckland a number of years ago I got stuck into this stuff uh, with polar watches and if we look at an ECG you know, it looks like beautiful sinus rhythm, but, but what it actually has is interbeat variability, um, and not each every beat is the same, and we can speed up or slow down our heart rate um, within in each beat, and what happens is with heart rate variability is you burn out that interbeat variability, so every one of these will be a thousand milliseconds or a, a second, so you want to actually have that interbeat variability, and we can measure, you know, it's the best measure of stress is this um, HRV, heart rate variability, rather than um, other measures of stress. So the other thing is, is the brain executive functions in HRV. So we lose our memory, we lose our planning, lose our concentration, lose attention, general mental flexibility and situational awareness. And you know, as, as clinicians, nurses, whatever we're doing, if um, you're doing accounts or you, you know, you're going to make mistakes, right? So the more burnt out you are, the more mistakes you make. Now. What I like to this one of the boats I work on or been up in the Arctic, and I guess one of the ways I, you know, help uh, stay off burnout is, is I spend like a month on one of these ships, um, and there's well the internet's very expensive, so you can stay off the internet, and um, they don't they tend to be a bit busy on the first couple of days when people are seasick, but um, you know you're not too busy, um, but it's just a really good way to just just detach from technology and get away. 
But we talk about our hardware, you know, like the neurotransmitters and, um, but you, you can't run good software on, on hardware. So, you know, on a, on a burnt out state, we have less neurotransmitters, we're more irritable. So this is why the standard things we talk about, but we probably don't do ourselves um, around um, nutrition, exercise, sunlight, time off. So as I say, you can't run good software on port hardware. And the way I, I like to talk about it is the mind is the software and the brain is the hardware. So we've got to really look after our hardware and our brain. Um, and for me, that's surfing, it's getting outside, you know, for uh, going for a walk in Fiordland or, you know, getting outside is, is really important to me. As I was going around the country, I did a study of 400 dairy farmers. Um, and, and one of the questions we had was, last time you had three days off. And quite a few people um, said, oh, 11 months ago, they had three days off, consecutive days off. And I'm like, well, what did you do 11 months ago? And they're like, oh, well, I went to field days. And, you know, you just we just can't work that hard and that long, whether you're a dairy farmer or whether you're a, you know, a, a you know, healthcare professional. Um, we, we do burn out. You just can't run our brains that hard. So let's, let's look at some management now. So we can measure, we can do a MASLAC, you can have a look at the, the Kine score. There's other um, Copenhagen inventories if you want to um, put them in your practice for, for measuring burnout and do a self-test every month. That's what we encourage in the Kind app every month. Just check your lights, check your orange lights, check your red lights, because um, unless you measure it, you can't sort of um, manage it really. So if you look at treatment, you know, Dr. Google, treatment for burnout, rest, well, it makes kind of sense, right? You just got to build your, your neurotransmitters up, nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, meditation, sleep. Um, I think seeking support is a big one. And, and we're often reluctant to, to, to put our hand up and say, hey, listen, I need a hand and I'm actually struggling. And, um, you know, it might just be changing in rosters or taking some time out or just, you know, doing things differently. And um, certainly I'm impressed, you know, with healthier homes and what they're doing and, and uh, trying to just manage our workload uh, differently. Uh, I guess one of the, the things I've noticed just looking through the literature and one of these definitions that resonated with me is, um, you know, a general absence of boundaries sometimes, especially if you're working in a small town like Fielding or somewhere, um, you might head up in the supermarket or head up somewhere. And um, I think one of the tools we really need to do is to say no sometimes um, with all the volunteering stuff we do, with compassionate people, you're on committees. And certainly you know, for me, I was on the school committee, I was on the district health board. And it was no wonder you kind of burn out because you don't know how to say no. So look, another thing for looking at um, burnout really is how you manage your workload and, and evaluating your options. And, and telehealth, you know, is obviously, you know, 20 years ago, I thought this was a great thing, but, you know, running a full day of patients, then going home and doing telehealth at night, um, often to, you know, patients that were in New York or Boston and, and John Hopkins. I mean, it wasn't really good for my, um, for my mental health. Um, you're basically working around the clock. Split shifts, evening shifts, I think that's one of the things with, with emergency um, medicine is what, what's really appealed to me as a career is, you know, you have the whole day off um, and then you, you might start at four. The trick is that you've got to make sure you're resting um, or surfing or doing something in that daylight hours instead of working uh, on your laptop and then going into uh, an evening shift at the ED till 2am and I've, I've been working at Auckland Hospital ED since 2007. Yeah, like a big thing for me is why I work during the day when the sun is out. And I just think with telehealth, um, you know, that it's important that, you know, you, I don't, I, I'm sure you could work it out uh, that you could do a lot of your e scripts or things in the evening and, and have a day off, right? And, and it's just how we roster it. And we're just sort of stuck into this. Everyone's got to turn up from nine to five um, when really the best part of the day is, um, is uh, during the day. You know, day off after a night on call, reduced jet lag. Um, and, you know, I, I try and, and do that when I do GP locums now. If I'm doing a night on call, I try and have the day off the next day because you just, it just does feel like jet lag and, and it is hard to maintain concentration. Um, and I just get worried about making a clinical mistake. Uh, either get a locum or do one is a good way to break out burnout. Um, and obviously taking holidays is really important. So look, you, this, you can Google this, but there's a 10 commandments of healthcare well-being. Um, you don't expect someone else to reduce your stress, uh, you know, especially management or something, just, just anyone to come along. It's just you've got to sort of take ownership of yourself. Don't resist change, such as healthcare homes. Um, you know, sense of purpose is important. You've got to look after yourself, right? Um, Honour thy limits. You know, we're not superhuman. We will break down um, just like anything else. Um, don't work alone. Uh, don't take it on others. We can get quite um, irritability as one of our um, 
symptoms of, of burnout. Um, and this is, you know, it seems a little bit trite, but not working harder, uh, just working smarter. And I think once again, I'm looking forward to uh, this presentation around how healthcare homes can help you do that. Seek to find joy and mastery in thy work um, and continue to learn. I just want to talk quickly a couple of minutes around um, family burnout and this are you okay thing is, is all right but I took my daughter to the Antarctic and I've taken both of my kids there and you know in a cabin asking if she's okay every day for a month and yeah I'm okay dad and we get back to Auckland and um, you know she had a kind score of 72 so you can use this um, app for your, for your kids um, or your, your, you know your friends and family use this, use this code be kind for NZ and I looked at her lights and you know after being away a month at sea and she's um, you know, got starting to get some burnout and I said you told me you're okay and she goes yeah but you know I'm running three jobs I've got all these assignments how am I ever going to buy a house in Auckland so I said look well let's go to the life section of the app you know kind life and um because there's a social um aspect and I really encourage you to go through the app I see quite a few of you done already you haven't all of you haven't filled out this depression anxiety and stress but Livy filled out that you know she strongly disagreed she had a sense of purpose and if you go back to those commandments um, one of those is having a sense of purpose and um so um, I said well pick one thing that's going to give you a sense of purpose and she said well I want a rescue dog or border collie and I said we'll do it but she lived in an apartment in Ponsonby and um she went and got this dog and ran it every day and exercised and um it really eased her, her kind of burnout and she's about to get married to a, a farmer in uh, Waitomo now so um is a good news story but social health has a big impact on our burnout as well um, we have a, what's called an expectation center if we don't get what we expect um, at work of our patients of our colleagues it sends a discharge down our worry circuit activates the grumpy unit at the bottom um, so sometimes um, you know we need a software application to, to try and regulate our, uh, our, our expectation center and this is where I come into, into software so software tools, we've got some e-learning for this, but this is basically CBT, which is a recognized treatment for burnout, providing your hardware is okay. Um, but if you're not angry right now, the only way you're gonna get angry is to think of something to make you angry, right? So often our thoughts that when we're going into work um, influence our emotions and our behaviors. And this is the, the wiring diagram of all our patients, our colleagues, um, our partners, MPs, whatever you want, trigger, thought, emotion, action, consequences, or benefit. So I'm really big on, on teaching tools of how we can manage our thoughts when we go to work and when we get home and manage our emotions um, and actions and, and consequences or benefit, depending if you have healthy thoughts or unhealthy thoughts. And that's why I've called this whole, pro whole process uh, healthy thinking. And we do run through a process of healthy thinking and, you know, maybe for another day I can do a, a whole seminar or something on healthy thinking, but, you know, thoughts aren't true, they're not worth it, 90% of the thoughts that make us feel bad aren't true, we fortune tell, I've developed all these profiles like the fortune teller, the judge, the demander, I went through looking at lots of sets of data, so, you know, people say, you should have seen me straight away, well, the trader is, I prefer to have seen you straight away, but I had these other appointments I had to do, and you just, it's all neurosemantic, so it, it is a real way to deal with burnout by just changing your language internally and externally and you know you walk in and your fortune teller might be oh it's going to be so busy today or you know I don't have many patients and then suddenly you're swamped and um, it's just trying to stay in the moment. Another one of these I call filtering or the do merchant no moan zones whereas you know you say well, what's the best thing that happened to you today so you might go home from work and you remember that one patient that was really difficult you replay that over and over again but the spin doctor will go what's the best thing that happened about your day today um, what about that one person you really helped and you know back to that joy of doing what we do. Cognitive switches, just sort of summing up, I've got about three minutes to go, I'm almost like speed dating through um, healthy thinking, <laughs> 20 years of work, but um, cognitive switches are things that you pre-download into your hard drive, um, so when things get really um, tough, whether it's ED or whatever you're doing, um, and some of my favourites, um, you know, I just take one patient at a time, and sometimes you can look at that waiting room or look at the, the board and go, oh my god, this is just, how am I even going to get out of here, they might not all be your patients, right, the thought isn't true. Um, change your attitude's a big one and you know I, I go around you know, the country doing locums and I go around the world teaching this stuff and just end with a story really but I um, was at one locum and I got turned up and I got coughed on you know sneezed on vomited on in this hospital and and I was like oh my god this is terrible and I was grumpy and irritable all day and didn't know how to use the practice management software and the next day I went back and I thought oh it's an evening shift I, I, I go around the world and say change your attitude or change your job. So I changed, you know, my sense of purpose is helping people. So when I went back into the waiting room, it was so busy the next day, I went, 
more people to help, more people to help. Look at them all, one patient at a time. And I never forget because this little kid came in with his mum to the ED and the nurse says, charge nurse goes, what's your problem? You know, and the, the mum goes, I think my son's got an ear infection. And the charge went, that's not an emergency, you know, see your GP. And I'm like, well, it kind of is. But anyway, we looked really frightened, really scared this uh, four-year-old kid. And I finally got him in the room and I said, mate, you look really frightened. And he goes, I think you look like a wrestler more than a doctor. But anyway, did the exam, looked in his ears, everything was fine. At the end, I said, I'm, you know, here's some antibiotics, whatever. And the mother said, I'm so glad I brought him in to see you, Dr. Tom. I'm like, why is that? You know, was, you know, I'm sorry about the reception. He goes, no. I said, you know, why didn't you bring him in? She said, well, just yesterday, there was a real grumpy doctor working here. And, you know, that was me. And the only thing I did was change my attitude, right? Some things can wait until tomorrow, next week. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm interested to hear Nikki next on how healthcare homes can help with some practical advice. But as I say, that's a 25 uh, minute run through 20 years of work. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm passionate about this stuff. And, and if you do have symptoms or signs of burnout, you know, get help, measure it, manage it, monitor it. And, and same with, you know, your own staff. If you, you can pick up, you know, little cues like irritability and maybe run through a formal assessment in, in a non-punitive way. And, and um, you know, because the amount of effort you put into training people, um, you know, if I gone on the scrap heap 20 years ago um you know it would be a lot different story so i really appreciated the support of the profession to get me back up to speed so there you go watch your kind score download it there's a code for yourselves and there's a code for your friends and family it just gives you a framework to go and and see if they've got any issues as well so you can use it at work and um yeah just something i'm passionate about so really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and i'll hand it over to you nikki I'll just um, jump in very quickly, um, Tom. Um, thank you. There's obviously lots in that, and it's really good that we're recording it because I know everyone will want to go back over and kind of go, gosh, there's just so much content there. Um, but certainly um, what you'll be pleased to know is that during the whole chat, um, some of those examples of um, well-being activities you know there's people out there doing rowing and walking and yoga and massage meditation handcraft gardening so you know that's really quite inspiring that you know we've got a crew that are have this top of mind but um, I certainly resonate with your comment around um, being able to say no because you know we do um, work in you know um, have work life we have home life and we have volunteer life and I think it is um we do want to do so much to give back to, you know, um, to others and societies, but learning to say no. So um, I think many of us here tonight need to probably think about that one. But yeah, thank you. That's um, wonderful, wonderful co content. We am um, capturing the questions, um, but what we'll do is we'll run the polls very quickly. I'll capture some of the questions that are coming through. And then Nikki, if you jump into that real practical side, that would be awesome. So um, this poll is really, as you can read on your screen, is just you know, self-explanatory in terms of your area of focus. So, uh, sorry, Abdul, are you waiting for me now? <laughs> um, I was just going to wait for that poll and Kirsten okay. was going to share, sorry, sorry um, is going to share that, that poll. But while we're sort of waiting for that, Tom, the quest, one of the questions that came through, and actually, Nikki, this is probably more for you, actually, um, saying this is great, but what I hear from GPs who work in healthcare homes is that it significantly increases their workloads, reduces their ability to set boundaries, has them answering patient emails at all hours and basically increases their risk of burnout. So I don't know, um, you know, Nikki, do you want to comment on that on that first? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, I think that um, Matt, Dr. Tom might be more um, qualified to comment on this one. I mean, I think it, it speaks to the issue of boundaries and, you know, there's a lot in it and, I think I mean, one of the things I'll talk about is the um, stresses now of having so many channels of communication, I think, and is really, really stressful. And it's um, you've got so many more places to look and messages coming here and there and everywhere. And I think also different people have different capacity to deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. so there's no simple answer, but 
and my view, if it's about healthcare home, I, my observation has been healthcare home reduces stress on the whole. But if somebody was feeling it had made it worse, then I think it would be worth looking at some of those things that Dr. Tom had talked about. You know, it's a, it's a boundary issue, really. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. simply, I mean, I always remind our GPs they don't have to be replying to their management health emails in the middle of the night or even the same day. You know, they're not, it's not for urgent. Like all that sort of stuff is how you can put boundaries around things like that. I know it's not as easy as that, but it's worth having a think about. Yeah. But couldn't, couldn't you, that's what I was saying, and like have a shift approach to it. I mean, if, if, obviously yeah. if, you're, if you're a single practitioner, but you say, look, you've got the day off or you, you've got the morning off and then you come in at one and you might go one till seven or something and you're just doing the telehealth and manage my health or my industry or whatever. And, you know, you, you, got, you, you wouldn't want to say, do, you, do your clinical practice, then go home and do that as well. That's a recipe for burnout. But if you can, you know, structure yeah. it that way and just try, you got to train your patients that this is, you know, you get your, this will happen between two and seven or something, you know? Yeah, cool. Um, hopefully you can see the results on that first poll. We have 23% GP, 2% nurse practitioner, 22% nurse, 4% practice manager, and um, we've got some practice admin and healthcare assistants there. Um, we don't have, we have zero healthcare assistants, but we do have some community organizations, um, government support in there, and. 29% other actually, so that's quite a big other. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, Nikki, I will hand over to um, you and maybe we'll run the other, um, other poll a little later. Just need to get rid of these results. Hopefully those are off your screen now. But yeah, over to you. Um, Nikki. Sure, well, thanks. Um, thanks, Amaja. And yeah, thank you, Tom. That was the type of information I felt like I wanted to just listen to, it was definitely not long enough, but, um, and I remember, I think I saw a presentation from you some years ago about surviving a tsunami, <laughs> is that, was that, and so I'm sure there's a lot more to your story, and I appreciate what we've heard so far, and um, yeah, that's, it's great. I, um, so I guess I'm going to change chat a little bit and want to talk about, um, more sort of an organ. I think burnout's an organisational issue as well. It certainly is from my perspective, and that it's something you know I have seen over the years many times. And um, I feel I don't think I've experienced burnout myself, but perhaps I've had no insight into that. But I've certainly seen it in other people, and it's con constantly on my mind as a manager about how we do things better in our organisation to reduce stress and burnout for people. So I have thought. A lot about it and um, tried a few things here at our place so I'm just going to read it this is a bit of an opinion piece I suppose um, tonight but I have done a lot of reading of literature and stuff like that which I've woven through here and there's a couple of references at the end so I just I guess I hope that um, I can present a very general practice specific context and that you will go away feeling like there's a little bit of optimism and we're not completely up against it in primary care and um, that you could maybe find one or two opportunities in your practice to um, to reduce burn, the risks of burnout or make the place you know, a bit easier for people. Um, and I'll address the issue of leadership as well and what sort of influence that has. So I'm just going to um, share my screen now with a bit of luck. Uh, this one. And I've just got a, this, got a few slides here to go through. Can you see that screen on the chat? Good. I've got quite a few screens in front of me. <laughs> Talk about multiple channels of things. Um, yeah. So I guess the um, general practice context is, um, I'm not going to dwell on it because we all know what the pressures are globally and nationally and, and all of our practices and consultations are going up. The number of consultations are going up. There's a whole lot of drivers for that. Uh, stress is increasing. Many of you would have read the GPNZ burnout workforce um, survey recently, so stress and burnout is definitely increasing. Funding on the whole is reducing, and um, I think even more recently, you know, there's even more funding pressures in terms of probably things like cash flow and that sort of stuff attached to vaccine programs and COVID and all of that, so people will be feeling that. 
the GP workforce is declining and retiring, we know that. Um, patient experience on the whole internationally and nationally is declining, and that's part of a culture of um, higher expectations, I think, from consumers as filtering into what filtering, spreading into healthcare. And it really um, culminates in a um, in a situation of just under, unrelenting demand in general practice and chronic excessive workload is, is the way that I would, would put it. So it's quite a big deal. It's a, um, it's a context that's you know, going to put us at very high risk of burnout, which we know already. The other important parts of context, in my view, for general practice, apart from the high burnout rates, is that we... Um, we're constantly dealing with problems that we don't always have solutions for um, in terms of don't have the time or the capacity or the place that we can go to solve what's in front of us. And it leaves people feeling like they um, haven't been able to you know, fix the problems or um, deal with what was in front of them. And it, it can just sort of, um, I suppose people can ruminate. So we and we have that constantly as an organization, as individuals, um, and that's right across us. I guess I want to point out to it's right across the general practice staff. And I've noticed more recently that administrative staff are um, having higher levels of stress, certainly at our practice. And I think a lot of it is driven by COVID and the demands and they're sort of that frontline screening um, a lot of the time. So it's um, everybody in the practice team is dealing with these problems that they often don't have a solution for. Um, it, as a manager, you know, you read all of the literature around how to deal with organisations and most of it will say, well, you know, take half a day, a day out and do some team building and exercises. And, and we all know in a general practice that you sort of hover around people's doors and hope that you get four seconds for a meaningful conversation with somebody. And it's really, really hard to find time to explore that sort of stuff. And it's a balancing act between um, patient needs and staff needs, because every piece of time you take away from, you take out to talk to staff and do that sort of stuff, you know, you're taking away from patient appointments. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and I think uh, the other thing that's really obvious to me in that, is that general practices, because we're often very small or medium-sized businesses, the leaders who are meant to um, provide a safe and good working environment or the owners and directors are often the, also the clinicians and um, the managers and the HR and you know people do everything. That's the nature of small business. Not, not unlike farming, actually, when you talk about um, farming, Tom, uh, similar thing, you know, you get families or um, small businesses where people just do everything. Uh, and so people look to leaders and the leaders are exhausted and, and burnt out themselves. Um, the managers often have lots of different roles. So you don't, we, you know, we don't have HR and finance and analysts and board secretaries, you know, we do it all. And so it's, it's quite challenging. We can't just draw on these special expertise to help when it's difficult. Uh, and obviously the level of um, burnout, you know, varies between practices. Uh, it's uh, less so typically in areas that are well staffed, whereas in rural areas it can be, um, you know, it, it, you see a lot more burnout often because of the nature of the role. Um, we're understaffed often with GPs and you tend to not be able to go home at night without people knocking on your door and things like that. So I think there's, um, there's variability. Um, the, I think the hope, though, from an organisational perspective is that the, the two things that I think help a lot uh, and the literature supports us are, are the um, areas of culture and leadership. And the culture of the, of the practices about the way things are done and how do we kind of talk about things and what are our behaviours. So I think about, you know, some practices that um, you... And, I also have to just put the disclaimer in that our practice is definitely not perfect. And we've, you know, these we've got issues like everybody else. And um, so I'm not, I don't want anybody to think that I think we are. But um, I think, you know, you can see a practice where somebody might call in sick and the talk around the, the room will be, oh no, you know, so and so's got a sick day again. Oh God, it's going to cause so much pressure on all of us and got to cancel all of the patients, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and then another practice might say, oh, it's, you know, oh, they are sick. Oh, no, hope they're okay. Well, um, let's see what we can all do and spread some workload around, et cetera. So I think the way we respond and behave to things um, say something about the culture of the practice. And the culture is a really big and powerful influencer in supporting people and, and um, reducing the risk of burnout. And one of the biggest things that influences culture is the leadership. So it's really important that all of us think about our leadership roles. And I'm not talking about just, you know, the hierarchy type leadership stuff, but um, you know, all of you will have things that you lead in your role, whether it be portfolio of um, clinical expertise or um, management or administration. So, you know, all of us have got the opportunity to influence this and, and the way we behave as leaders um, has a big imp impact on culture. The I think the opportunities that we've got as leaders is once we've, you know, done a bit of self-care and it was great to see all the chat coming up, see all the yoga and running and everything that people have been doing. So once we've done all of that stuff, which is really important, we, um, in my view, I think we need to just kind of take a step back and not be quite so hard on ourselves. You know, as leaders, we don't have to be perfect either, but I think it, we do need to be spin doctors a lot of the time and um, the way it be a bit optimistic for the sake of our teams. You know, we don't want to be um, negative and um, we set a tone, I think. And to, to be honest, I think um, GP owners are often some of the most influential people in small to medium size practices so if you're in that basket you know I think it's really important that we can sort of set some positive behaviors and um which I'm sure everybody does but it's a it's a very influential position in my observation uh the I, this is uh, the technology thing is a really big deal I think and um I mean not only at our place but I go home and live with a clinician who has the stuff and it's you know, not just the clinical days, but then the, the clinical work through um, patient portals, but, you know, all this, we've got Teams and WhatsApps and all of that stuff. And some days I just find it impossible to turn it off. And I've worked out now that I have to actually sign out of things to reduce all the notifications. And um, it's just overwhelming, but I think we need to find ways to turn it off. And I, I suppose as a leader, I um, the way I try and role model good behaviour around that is not set examples of expecting people to respond immediately. I, I try not to be lazy with my communication. So if it's really important, I'll you know try and pick the right way to communicate rather than just chucking out an instant message and that sort of stuff. It's a bit, um, I think we're a bit haphazard at times and then expect everybody to respond. So that, that's a really big deal in my, in my mind. The... Um, I think the other thing is that the, the risk factors have mitigations from an organisational perspective, and um, my view would be that supportive teamwork is a big mitigation to some of those risk factors that I talked about. And the other one is um, psychological support. So we're ex at the moment exploring the idea of actually having an on-site um, sort of counsellor or psychological support service on a regular basis. Uh, and I suppose, I mean, it's... A, it would be a luxury for us, for us because we're a slightly bigger practice, we can afford potentially to do it. But just having someone there that people can drop into and talk to, a little bit like the health improvement roles we have for our patients, I think that being there in a timely manner to have a chat when um, people need to sort of offload or talk about stuff is, is good to have at work as well as at home. Because, you know, sometimes we don't want to talk to our managers and sometimes we don't want to talk to our partners and sometimes they don't want to hear it you know it's kind of I think it's good to have someone independent so we will explore that as a um, as a um, way of mitigating some of the risk factors so I'm just keeping an eye on the time um, and <laughs> tell me if I need to um, to stop but we're, we're nearly there and um, this is more of a sort of a, our organization's experience of some of the things that we've tried and like I said some of these have um, I think been positive but we've not had a research program to tell us <laughs> I think some of them work quite well we've run a um, staff survey for three years in a row now and um, it's kind of a pretty simple one that people just fill in um, it's got some areas around environment and support and leadership and um, work-life balance and that sort of stuff 
uh, and it's anonymous, they chuck it in a box and we um, analyze the feedback. And that's been quite good to look at year on year trends and the, the general trend is um, incremental, um, incrementally people are feeling better about their well-being but there were some really strong themes that came through last year around people feeling like um, management weren't listening to them and and that sort of stuff so that was really good to it was hard to hear because you know so you, you think you're doing well sometimes and then suddenly you find out you're not but um, it was also really important to hear that and I don't think we would have unless we had carried out the survey so I think they're good and they tell you whether or not you're heading in the right direction or the general well-being is getting worse um yeah I, I mean I go on a bit about business models but I do believe some of the business models and general practices don't promote um I think they can increase the risk of burnout and that they focus on individuals and throughput a lot to um to improve the business and I think other some other types of so cost year models for example in my view are difficult in that way they look at individuals and productivity and um, they don't look at the organization as a whole and I think that by looking at the organization as a whole you're not sort of feeling so much pressure on yourselves or not so much sense of like oh, I'm working harder than they are and um, I think it's worth considering whether your business model uh, promotes a, you know a healthy approach to uh, well-being is it's an important one um, HR support can be helpful I mean I have to admit I'm not a huge um, advocate for a lot of HR support because I think it can be expensive and sometimes you can kind of find those corporate HR organizations that uh, will you know tell you a hundred things that are wrong with your organization through a few um, standard methodologies so if you're going to get some HR support it can be really helpful but find someone that really understands the general practice environment and what you can actually achieve and what you can't achieve and can't do. Uh, we add staff wellbeing as an agenda at our directors meeting and board meetings so there's an accountability from management to the board in terms of what we're actually doing to maintain wellbeing. Uh, we, I think one of the really good things about healthcare home that, I, that I've seen is that it offers flexibility and scheduling. So our clinicians can basically set their, as long as they um, work within some broad parameters, they can set up their days. These are GPs I'm talking about actually in terms of clinicians, set up their days as they like them. So they can do some phone consults and then some face-to-face -face consults. They can take a couple of hours in the middle of the day, go to the gym, go down to the rest home and do the rest home consults. That sort of stuff, they can start late, finish late to um, some extent. And um, it, everybody's a little bit different, I think in terms of their energy levels. So like I'm a first thing in the morning person then, um, you know things die off a bit at about 11 o'clock and then I perk up at a bit, a bit about four o'clock so for me having a middle of the day break is quite good and um, so it's good to have a model that can people can control it and match it with their kind of energy levels I suppose uh, and I mean another one I want to add in as, as well is that I think I always feel much better and I think our organisation performs better as a whole and we get really good support from DHBs and PHOs and we get positive communication about our work rather than sort of that directive authoritarian um, style communication from above. So that's really just thrown in there as a um, message, I suppose, to DHBs and those types of organisations to think about that given that we're a network of people that are prone to burnout and you know what will help and what won't help that. Um, just quickly, this is something that we introduced with staff about a, I don't know, a few months ago and it's actually really good. It's probably a little bit like the measuring thing that um, Tom talked about. It's, just, it's a way of measuring and something really quick, I can do with staff in about 10 minutes, how are you feeling about work? One's awful, ten, and you just, I scribble it down on a piece of paper and then um, scan it in somewhere. So I've got a record and I can look back on how people are going. Um, and you can send it to people to have a think about before and then have a bit of a talk about it. So yeah, I think it's um, it's a really good, good thing to do rather than, you know, those big performance reviews and things like that we do, we think we have to do, I suppose. And um, yeah, this is all you need really in terms of being able to check in on staff. Uh, and th this is just some stuff that um, we've 
uh, some reflections, I suppose, from me in terms of culture at our place. Uh, we, like I said, we've had a year-on-year -year improvement in well-being, a little bit of improvement. It's not a drastic change or anything like that, but it's heading in the right direction. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that um, in our practice, the culture was that like, who could have Friday off? Like, nobody should have Friday off because that's not fair. Why should you get Friday off? <laughs> and it's, but when you look at the demand profile of um, appointment demand, Friday's the obvious day that some people should have off from a business perspective, if nothing else, because it's much quieter than Mondays. And yet we had this situation where we had lots of people taking Mondays off and it was just part of the culture of the practice. So um, we've got a culture now where it's actually okay to have Friday off. Um, it's okay to go to the gym at lunchtime. It's okay to have a sick day and other people will help and support you when you have a sick day. Um, it's okay to share your responsibilities and you can expect other people to help you when you're not there. And I think um, then this relates to the business model, model as much as just teamwork is that everybody contributes differently, both positively and negatively to the organization and everybody works at different rates. So I think it's really important we can kind of get up and look from the balcony at the organization as a whole rather than the slave to the appointment books and you know who's seeing the most patients and stuff like that so um, somebody might be seeing a lot of patients another person is spending a lot of time supporting staff and teaching and you know that there's so much that people add in different ways um, and lastly these are a few just wellness perks that we tried that people seem to like. Most of the ideas have come from the staff. Uh, so we offer free consultations for our staff. We're the only practice sort of in our broad area. So most of our staff are enrolled with us. They get four free nurse or doctor consults a year. They can stay home on their birthday and um, be paid for it. They've got EAP and counselling. We always have free fruit in a sort of an accessible area. Um, and we have a woman who comes and does these little 15 minute back rubs every once um, once a week, which everybody looks forward to. So that's nice. People pay for those, but you know, it's nice just to have, have her around. And um, yeah, that's, that's me. I hope that there's some little things that might be useful for you to think about. And I'd be really interested to hear from others about what they do in their practices as well, if you want to chuck anything through on the chat. Thanks, Nikki. Um, if you want to stop sharing, that will be awesome. And then we'll get to see um, more of the people on, on the screen. Um, gosh, certainly, yes, there's um, a lot in your um, slides, too, that we will obviously go back over in the recording. But just want to highlight the technology, um, because I know I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty of... Um, knowing that my phone is never hardly leaves my side, you know? Um, I do, like Fiona um, in the chat um, mentioned about do using delayed um, time for your emails. I'm guilty of that so that I don't impact on my team or others across the network, but that's still doing a disservice to me. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, um, really, um, I know that I've got work to do. So um, yeah, the technology, and I know that in places like France, they're legislating um, in terms of employers not contacting staff outside of hours, et cetera, you know? So whether we come to that level or not, but um, certainly um, technology is a, a big factor in terms of our well-being, and as you've stated, and as, as Tom stated. Um, there is, There are, sorry, some questions. Um, one of them from Claudia. Um, if staff struck business well-being is addressed as a whole within the business model, would other supports in achieving a more holistic? I'm just trying to get the rest of the question because it's sort of taken off my screen. Um, let me just start that one again. Um, where is it? One second. So it was only letting me see half of it on the on the chat. Um, so if staff and business well-being is addressed as a whole within the business model, would other supports in achieving a more holistic patient outcome, supporting the meaningful contribution factor for professionals like Fano consults, group self-management classes, et cetera, be another way to find innovative ways forward? Um, 
Tom, do you want to add, add to that? Can you see the question in the chat or do you want me to? Um... You're on mute, Tom. I used to own my own general practice about 20 years ago, right? And um, and now I really enjoy being a locum because I don't have to do all that business management stuff. And you know, I just want to turn up with my stethoscope and be a doctor. And I think that was one of the things that really contributed to burnout is practice meetings and running books and debtors and that. And it was, you know, huge with a young family, huge load, right? So I'm not really probably the best person to, to state about running the business. I just turn up with my stethoscope. But in terms of practice, so what I see going around the country is why I go there and they just shut the place down at lunchtime. They have a shared lunch that is put on and the doors are locked and the community are used to it that, um, you know, between, unless it's an emergency, um, you know, between whatever the hours are, at least an hour, everyone just sits down and has a kai together and um, it's, you know, it's a, just, it's a, it's a really good thing. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. setting, you know, especially community you kind of you can train them and, and say, well, this is how we want to practice it. And this is what we want to do. And this is kind of, you know, um, and get them on board with it as well would be my suggestion, but it's that business model, as you say, they're all just cracking through the numbers and it's, you know, it's hard trying to balance those books. Mm. Yeah. Thanks Tom. Um, and thank you, Jess, for sharing uh, the link to our survey, which is, um, there's an example staff engagement survey. And then Nikki, we may well ask you for a copy of yours as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're more than happy to share that uh, across, across the network. Um, in terms of, I'm just looking for any other questions. Kirsten, would you like to run the second poll, please? Um, and while we're doing that, I might, um, call on um, Gary Sutcliffe. Um, I did give him a heads up uh, because I know when he put in his chat, um, one of the things in terms of his well-being, I would really like him to share um, a little bit more about the, the one thing he did for uh, improving his own well-being because I think that's a brave, um, brave but necessary um, thing that he did. So Gary, if, are you happy to take yourself off mute to share with the group? Are you there, Gary? Um, yes, I am. Uh, but you. she probably can't hear me too well. Hang on. Okay, is that better? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, look, it just happened to coincide with it being the the webinar being tonight. Yeah, look at somebody that um, that I try to support um, in a lot of ways. He has significant mental health issues, but also has a lot of anger. And his anger is against mental health services, against the police, it's against the ACC, it's against everybody. Um, but he rants quite a lot. And he's become quite abusive, not to me directly, but to people who are trying to support him. And I was talking with another person who I know well, um, and I saw a couple of emails and I thought, I can't do this anymore. And I, I mainly to preserve my own mental health, um, but because I've got enough things in my toolbox to, to be able to avoid it dragging me down, I just thought, no, that's the end. And I send him a message and say, look, this is the last time you hear from me. And I told him why, and um, I got a very rude reply back to that, but I think it was a good move that I made. Yeah, so I think those those borderline personality patients are, you know, something else, and I guess maybe it's quite tough. Was anyone else burnt out from um, uh, this anti-vax um, uh, uh, especially on social media, and I, I started off feeling like I had some responsibility to to try and answer every question, and I get referred to all these videos and rabbit holes, and um, I think I, I lost my um, rag a little bit with a with a friend who sent me um, another thirty minute video to watch, and, and tried to say that um, I, I, sh I have to watch it as my duty, but you just burnt out from watching all these videos, which are quite insulting. Um, and I don't know if anyone else is feeling the same thing. I was just saying, look, talk to your own doctor about it, and. Um, just, uh, just trying to fight this 
tirade of anti-vaxxers is quite exhausting and I'm, I certainly feel burnt out from it and you know um, probably haven't handled the last few as a you know so I'm sure there's a curve yeah um, that is tricky but a few um, people with you on that one by the looks of the chat there Tom <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I was just going to see if I can share my um, cartoon. Yeah. I saw a really good cartoon. I don't know if I can share this, the photos. Yeah. Um, this one, I'll share that. Have you seen this one? Are you taking me to the hospital? No, sir, you need top medical experts. We're taking you to the comment section. <laughs> just a black screen, Tom. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. That's, basically, it yeah. says, um, is, it, is an ambulance going with, a, with an ambulance officer into the ambulance and the patient's still strapped in going, are you taking me to the hospital? And the, and the patient and the ambulance officer says, no, no, you need really top expert uh, medical advice. We're taking you to the comment section of Facebook. So um, yeah. it's... Uh, yeah. Um, once, you, once you answer one, you know, then you're obliged to you just go down this rabbit hole, you know, and it's just never ending. It's just this yeah. onslaught of anti-vax. Yes. And, um, you know, someone said to me recently, um, it's it's dividing friendships, families, you know, it's, it is a real, real issue. And certainly I do have um, that in my own fauna as well. I mean, they're mostly overseas. But yes, now interesting, just I'm not sure if everyone saw those results, but of the audience tonight, uh, over 100 um, participants, um, we've got 12% burnt out. Um, so I'm sure Tom's got more advice for you on the call tonight in terms of, you know, really taking care. 51% um, um, of you are tired um, and 37% 30, feel pretty good. Um, but yeah, the fact the fact that fifty one percent feel tired and um, twelve percent burn it burns out that's pretty um, pretty worrying um, in terms of you know how we how we manage that and obviously the content tonight is is just one part of um, you know many um, many initiatives really to try and shift things um, yeah. I just encourage you to fill out the fill out the kind app, you know, and um, especially the number you haven't done the depression, anxiety, and stress, um, the DAS, which is in there. So fill that out. I don't know if you can see my uh, probably not. It's a little bit, but uh, it, it enables you to. Um, it's a bit hard with that virtual screen, but you can graph it. You know, once a month, just do it because it's quite insidious. This burnout stuff, and that's what mm -hmm. I'm big on. Yeah, once a month, it takes you like five minutes, and you fill out the scores, and you can ask each other like, "What's your kind score?" And have you got orange or red lights? And talk to your family about them, and you know, you'd be surprised, you know, um, what what you come up with. And that's what I found useful with my own kids. And I didn't oh, say before, my audit, my daughter uh, is the CEO of the app company now, so um, I can move away from that management. But um, yeah, just just measure yeah. yourselves, you know, and, and that's and then do something about it, right? Before. Yeah before we do become burnt out. Hmm. Um, before we um, uh, close off for the evening, I just wanted to um, ask if anyone in the audience did want to share anything um, themselves, certainly pop your hand up and you can take yourself off mute because I think this is a, you know, we try to make our sessions, you know, um, more engaging uh, and really want to sort of, you know, learn from the audience and, and really, you know, um, as David McKee has said, you know, welcome to healthcare. Healthcare is, is a, you know, a profession that tires, <laughs> tires. We're all passionate about what we do and we go above and beyond. So it isn't surprising as, as David's alluding to that 51% are tired and 12% are burnt out. But if anybody else wants to share tonight, um, I won't do what some of our other um, presenters that we had supporting us on the collective impacts of where they, they pick on people although I did pick on you Gary <laughs> but I asked your permission first um, but if anybody wants to feel free um, you can have the floor um, the beautiful fire mill will close us off with Karakia um, soon but uh, just want to um, give that opportunity um, I guess, um, Amaji, I'm sorry, I can't say hello or, or show my video, guys, because even though I've just had my first jab, the internet in Kerry Kerry is worse than ever. So I apologise for that. But um, I, I guess one of the things that I'm noticing now is that um, traditionally, I'm, I'm very new in this um, sector, 
And traditionally what I've done in the past is look for support from those within my sector that I feel understand the pressures that I'm under. Um, and one of the wisdoms that I um, have gained is that um, actually because what I do in health isn't really um, have a, a set title, I've, I've found much more value looking outside um, of, of where I work and, that, and, and, you know, rather than having that kind of siloed view, just look for the happy places, look for the places that lift you, you know, whether it's kids or dogs or um, fresh air or, um, you know, your nana or whatever. Um, don't, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have that um, interprofessional network. But um, there's this whole other, um, you know, while we head down butt up in our sector, and we kind of get into our kind of health silo. There's this whole other humanity happening outside that want to connect with you too, as people. So, um, you know, and um, yeah, thank you all for the work you do. And thanks guys for the presentation, really enjoyed it. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Kaloria. Um, I'm just looking at one of the, the other chats that it is difficult as a medical leader to take time out during a pandemic. And um, just to reiterate the commentary, um, that I put in my chat in the chat personally was, you know, just really want to thank everybody who's out there frontline and also the behind the scenes service, um, because, you know, we take our hat off to you in everything that you're doing um, to keep, you know, the country safe. Uh, and it is, it, it's, um, it is a difficult time. I, I, I hear you. Um, just looking more of the chat. Anybody else? Any last takers before we do uh, our final call to action and also pass over to the, the lovely fire Merle? It is getting late and obviously want to give you some time back um, so you can uh, spend that time with your Fano and just hopefully get a rest um, this evening. But I guess if there were to be some call to actions it would be to you know download the kind app and and see how that works for you because i know that i personally will um like seeing that visual of how i'm doing you know and and and, and, and motivate me to do better for me and my far now um use the people around you for support um you know the things that tom and nikki has have shared we'll we'll send out the presentations and we'll send out the recordings but you know, take take heed um, as best you can. Keep on with that rowing and walking and yoga. And I'm going to start hot yoga soon. <laughs> I keep telling myself, but I'm I'm going to be on a mission. So yeah, keep up keep up that um, activity because I guess it, it you know for that whole well being. Um, but Tom, do you have any final words? And then Nikki, I'll hand over to you um, just for some final words of wisdom. Yeah, look, I think. <laughs> I think, you know, like it was David to, you know, welcome to healthcare. And, and I just, you know, I'm kind of, well, it's fortunate, but I've created this, you know, life with lots of different strings to my bow and I can, you know, in the corporate environment, but then I'll go back into a locum. And, and when you get that break, you know, you go back to being a, into general practice and primary care. And it's just so awesome, you know, um, because you're not there all the time. And then you go back and, and you get that love of what, why you became you know, in healthcare in the first place. And certainly I know a few people that can't work now for, for whatever reason and, and they really miss it. So I think it's, you know, it is still the best job in the world. It's just how much of a dose we get of it, right? And, and you know, I think the ending, you know, on that, that is, it is a, a great job and great people. It's just, uh, we just do burn out because we just did too much of it. So take those breaks. Oh. Thanks, Tom. And Nikki? Yeah, um, I would have prepared if I thought there was some final words. <laughs> the only thing I can think of really is a um, message to people in leadership roles that, you know, it's really important to step up when people are really burnt out, I think, and, um, and you know, look after yourself and do it, and you need to really focus on those self-care things even more so that you can be there to lead others it's a really important and influential role and it sets the tone for people day to day in a workplace often so just you know have a think and, and reflect on that and it's work in progress you know you have good days and bad days I don't I definitely am not perfect every day but if I have um, more good days and bad days so then that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, Judy's just mentioned, no one's mentioned compassion, but yes, that's a, a big part of it. You know, be compassionate with each other. I know within my very small team, we um, 
we work super hard we're all twin mums and we multitask like crazy but we um you know we try to have those well-being conversations you know just to keep it to keep it real and um whilst we often don't take our own advice but we we do put an emphasis on it so thank you now fire mail would you like to close us in karakia that would be lovely and any words from yourself would be welcomed Ka pai tēnā, kia ora mai tata katoa, pai ki te whakarongo i au koutou kōrero, he hanga mea pai mō ngā, mō ngā mahi o koutou katoa. Thank you, Amajet, and thank you for asking me right up to this part. Some of the things I'm, I might just like to share back before I go into karakia and our proverb, our proverb before we close. <clears throat> Wonderful corridor, honest and truthful. Dr. Tom Mulholland, the answers that you have, it's in your honesty and you reflect the culture of health. When we say there's a culture and we talk about it only in the clinic, what you have shown in your presentation and that will bring to life again for everyone else is that the culture of health is outside the clinic too. I just absolutely loved what you did with your daughter going to the Antarctica. If that is the answer to the burnout, everybody book a ticket to the Antarctica because in the role and the profession, the careers that you are all taking up or have taken on, you are on spark. You are like broadband, 4G, 5G. The only way for the burnout and the leadership things to come down, turn it off. Dr. Tom said, turn it off. Go to the Antarctica. Where's that other place? The tools that have been presented. I love what Nikki and her team are doing in the clinics. What is innovation and change? How different that must sound to everybody. Take Friday off. Why not? What I hear is honesty and acceptance so that the move can happen. I'm not going to say any more about that because kei a koutou, kei roto i tēnā mahi, hei mahi. You will continue to do it anyway. Oh, Dr. Tom, I missed your, your mihi mihi. Maybe I will catch it next time. Anyway, the, the other thing I want to leave you with, this is a whakatoki, a proverb. On the things that I have heard tonight, I believe unless we give ourselves the permission, taring a whakarongo, have a listen. Ki te wātea, te hene ngaro, me te kaharere, o te wairua, ka taia ngā mea katoa. I'll go over that. Ki te wātea, te hene ngaro, when the mind is free, me te kaharere o te wairua, the spirit is willing. Ka taia ngā mea katoa. That is when anything is possible. Anyway, ka nui te aroha ki a koutou katoa e whakarongo ana ki te kōrero ana i te wā whakamutinga he inoi so we will go with karakia and the closing prayer this evening. I'd like to thank our panellists, Ngā Mihi Kia Kōrua, Dr. Tom, Nikki, Amajit, Jess and um, Kirsten, wonderful mahi. To all the viewers and people asking questions and being more informed and taking away the information. 
may I suggest whenever I was given the permission for things I wanted to do, I couldn't get it fast enough. Please, giving yourself the permission to be free, to find the space. You more than have the knowledge you are on 5G. Anyway, may I please ask, I'm going to leave it there, I'll ask Amajit for the karakia that, um, that you would normally put up. Thank you. Kirsten, would you like to share the screen, please? Kia ora mai tata katoa nei te tahi atu he karakia whakamutunga. So you see our closing prayer. Just before I go into Te Reo Māori, may I let you know, may peace be widespread, may the sea glisten like green stone, and may the shimmer of light dance across your path and guide you on your way. Anei te tahi atu, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapapau namu te moana, kia tere te kārohi rohi i mua i tō huarahi. Anei te tahi atu, Thank you, Amajit, for this year. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Kakite. Anno. Does it have work?